Late Night Health continues. Our guest is Dr. Alberto Hayek. Uh, he's a medical doctor. Uh, he is the scientific director at San Diego Scripps Whittier Institute for Diabetes. He's a professor emeritus. You're too young to have retired, Doc. Um, no, of, I am not. <laughs> of <laughs> pediatrics at UCSD. He's a world-renowned diabetic expert, and he serves as the uh, uh, president and scientific advisor for the Diabetes Research Connection. I guess the big thing about the Diabetes Research Connection is you're you're looking for, for up-and-coming scientists rather than um, older guys. Is that the uh, the genesis of, of what the diabetic Diabetes Research Connection is all about? Yeah, well, the target for funding are young investigators, which is a niche for funding that uh, no other foundation is uh, actually targeting. Uh, so a person who is a graduate student at a university or a postdoctoral fellow <clears throat> uh, in the first couple of years or an instructor or up to an assistant professor, then <clears throat> people who have a higher academic ladder don't qualify because they have a lot of other options for funding their research. And they also have, they're somewhat jaded. They, I mean, they, they, you know, they may know how to play the game better. The established investigators? Oh, yes. yes. Of course. Yeah, of course. <clears throat> so, but uh, since we are taking really, really very beginning of a research career, then nobody really targets them for funding. And that was the idea of uh, setting up uh, this foundation. And that's because new guys, new gals have different, new, different approaches? <clears throat> well, let's, let, let's take the case of a postdoc. This is an individual who has gone through medical school or has gotten a PhD. And then, uh, in our case, we do funding restricted to type 1 diabetes. So let's say the person is working in the lab of very well-established investigators. This his salary will be covered, <clears throat> but the principal investigator will assign the type of work that he has in mind. But during the course of the work, a young person may come out with a really very nice idea, which is not part of the uh, research plan of the principal investigator. So he, either the principal investigator decides to give him some funding out of his own, or he tells him, look, I'm really sorry, but I have a lot of projects to do, and this one doesn't fit in our environment. So the person is sort of stuck. So our plan is to give this person the opportunity to do the very initial experiment, sort of proof of principle to see if it works. If it works, of course, most likely the principal investigator will add more funding, but people like to see some sort of uh, results before giving money or allocating funds from other sources. Got it. Let's talk about diabetes type 1, or okay. I guess it's called T1D. Is that the uh, the technical T1D, term? T1D, that's T1D. right. T1D. Yeah. And mm -hmm. then diabetes 2, T2D? Or is that's that too correct. simple? Oh. Yeah, T2D. Yeah. I should have I should have gone to medical school. <laughs> no, but you know, in a simplistic way, got it. Type one diabetes is the one that requires insulin. Without it, insulin, a diabetic person dies, do, and it's a complex immune disorder in which the immune system in a person fails to recognize his own insulin-producing cells, and the immune uh, system reacts as is this person getting some new cells that are not part of the the, the, the cells assembly in cells like. So they go and destroy the cells, and then if there are not enough insulin-producing cells, the person becomes a diabetic, and there is no way to control the blood sugar, which gets really high if insulin is not administered. How did you... You're, you're considered one of the world's leading experts in diabetes. How did you become interested in that? I began as a pediatric endocrinologist with emphasis on pediatric diabetes. And uh, throughout the early phases of my career, I began to realize that things were changing very fast in the way that uh, children or young people with diabetes are treated. 
but there were really a lot of very capable investigators or uh, 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 sorry clinicians taking care of those kids. So I thought, and this goes back to the to the eighties. I decided that I much rather put some time in research trying to solve the issue of uh, how can we replace the cells that were lost, or how could we avoid the damage to the cells when the diabetes is first detected. And diabetes and type diabetes type one is used to be known as juvenile diabetes that's because correct, it yeah. usually manifests early in life. That's correct. But then as things became more 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 complicated, we began to see that not only young people develop diabetes type one, but also older people. Matter of fact, right now there are a lot more people diagnosed with type 1 diabetes under the age of 5 and then adolescents and then curiously after the age of 65 or 70. So it is perfectly uh, common to see people today developing the type 1 diabetes in their 60s or 70s. And and you can tell the difference, I mean, between 1 and 2? Yes, and it's, it's rather easy, although sometimes you are sort of in between type 1 and type 2. But in most cases, type 2 is the famous epidemic that uh, is associated to, with obesity and with the insulin resistance. And that type of diabetes is managed with uh, pills. Pills or exercise, taken, right? drugs, maybe supplements. Exactly. Uh, that's right. Yeah. So it's lifestyle plays a huge uh, importance in the development of type 1 diabetes. I'm sorry, type 2. But in Taiwan, lifestyle really has little to do with the developing of uh, Taiwan diabetes. And does the same kind of work or lifestyle work for diabetic type 1? In, in no, other... it doesn't. It, it doesn't. doesn't. You know, like uh, lifestyles of kids is very similar. <laughs> so uh, even, you know, uh, most kids with Taiwan diabetes are lean rather than obese. Uh, also, of course, obese kids can also develop type uh, 1 diabetes. When you and I were kids, uh, our food was fresher. Our parents made it, kicked us out of the house, and we had to ride our bikes around the neighborhood. And kids today sit on the couch, and they're, you know, they're, they're playing tennis with, um, with, with some kind of PlayStation. With the games in the computer. Yeah, that's yeah. right. So that is a very important contributor to type 2 diabetes and the obesity and the kids who's in front eating potato chips and playing games or just playing watching TV. So as life goes on, the amount of time spent sitting down and playing games or watching TV, unfortunately not reading the books, then really contributes to type 2 diabetes. And But it, does exercise play any role at all? I mean, other than general maintenance for the body in type 1? Absolutely. Once diabetes begins, besides giving people insulin, exercise is one of the most efficient ways that we have to lower the blood sugar. So, so and of course, a healthy diet, you know, a diet that is very rich in carbohydrates, contributes to high uh, glucose levels. Uh, so diet, exercise, and insulin are the three main uh, forms of uh, treating a person with type 1 diabetes. As uh, uh, people immigrate to the United States and adopt the American lifestyle, uh, uh, Hispanics, uh, Eastern Europeans, <laughs> Jews, um, I'm trying to think, African Americans, all have a higher incidence of of type, di diabetes. type 2 diabetes than the, right, yeah. the, the general population. Yeah, that's right. I think that from the racial point of view, the highest incidence of type 1 diabetes is seen in the Scandinavian countries. For instance, Finland has the highest incidence of type 1 diabetes than Sweden, Norway. Uh, so, so it is really extremely important to consider the racial background in the diagnosis of type 1 diabetes. But fortunately, uh, through research, there are now ways to diagnose diabetes before it begins. There are some markers 
in the blood. So one can take a blood sample. Let's say the family has a mom or a dad with Taiwan diabetes, or the parents are normal and one of the children develop diabetes. If we look at the blood of these kids, they have antibodies against the cells that produce insulin. And these antibodies are very easily detected. And then uh, there are several uh, of these antibodies. So if two or three of those antibodies are present, the certainty of the diagnosis of diabetes is almost 100%. We oh, don't know wow. how. Yeah. Wow. Uh, there have been, I mean, Mary Tyler Moore is probably, the, <coughs> to me, the best known uh, uh, personality that That's right. uh, was very active in in uh, you know the juvenile juvenile diabetes association. Yeah, uh, she, juvenile diabetes research foundation. Yeah, she has been working for years, running about fifty years on yes. behalf of the foundation, raising funds for research into finding a cure for type one diabetes. So she certainly has helped the cause of uh, of finding a cure. Uh, tremendously and and her her high profile of course uh you know from her days on the dick van dyke show and uh she was on um her legs i think were featured on hawaii not uh hawaii and i uh but uh she's maintained you know a good body uh didn't get fat all of these kinds of things can does that help maintain diabetes type yeah, 1? Yeah, of course, of course. I yeah. think that normalizing the blood sugar levels certainly avoids the complication of type 1 diabetes, which are really very severe, like blindness, uh, cardiovascular problems, uh, early heart attacks, uh, uh, peripheral neuropathy, very painful uh, extremities because of uh, problems with the nerves, uh, failure of the kidneys. I think that the largest percentage of people who lose the kidneys to, uh, is probably m- mostly related to diabetes. So there are... Either one, di- one, one and two, or just one? Mostly with type one, but type two diabetes could lead also to, 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 to renal failure and the need for a transplant. Right, or, uh, so or dialysis. The, I guess. That, well, it starts, the person cannot use their kidneys anymore, so they go on dialysis, but, you know, dialysis is really, it, it, it's complicated, it really changes your life. Absolutely, absolutely. Like three times hours in these centers for dialysis, so those people really benefit by renal transplant. Well, doc- unfortunately, yeah. doctor, I'm going to ask you to hold on. We're going to take a short break, do some work, and then we okay. will come back and continue our discussion of the Diabetes Research Connection. And we're going okay. to find out what the mission is now that we understand di- okay. the difference between uh, type 1 and type 2. Uh, I'm Mark Allen. This is Late Night Health. Join us at LateNightHealth.com, LateNightHealth.com. <laughs> 